better than victory over a thousand is victory over one person, yourself. It's a verse in the Dhammapada. And it points us to a very important principle. What exactly do you want to win in this lifetime? What do you want to gain? What battles are worth fighting? That's the primary talent of a good warrior, is knowing which battles are worth fighting and which ones are not. Places where you have to accept defeat for the strategic purpose of coming out ahead someplace else, it really matters a lot more. There are things we may want out of other people, respect, sometimes just acknowledgement of our existence or acknowledgement of our worth as a person, but they don't want to give it. So you have to ask yourself, is it really worth fighting for? And what does the fighting accomplish? Is it going to gain any respect? Because there's so many battles in the world there that just lead to bad karma, even when you win, especially when you win sometimes. You look at the history of the world. Nations who had to fight a battle and ended up being transformed, even as they won, into the enemy, taking on the enemy's characteristics. Is that what you want? And when you win a battle, you gain the animosity of those who lost. This is why the Buddha said it's better look to the battles inside, the battles over your own defilements, your own greed, aversion, and delusion. That's a battle that can be won. And when you win, you don't create any bad karma. And as for whether the people outside will acknowledge your victory, that doesn't really matter. In fact, as John Lee once said, the things that other people know about aren't safe. You know for yourself, nobody else has to know. You look at the history of Buddhism. Where is there the history of those who truly gained awakening? We know there are some people who are reported to have gained awakening, either through their own report or their, the belief of their followers. But who really knows? It's something purely internal. But it matters where it matters most, because there's that other thing that's purely internal as well, and that's your experience of suffering. We each suffer, but we can't feel another person's suffering. We can sometimes sense that they're suffering, but we actually can't feel their pain. But we can feel ours. It's the subjective experience. And as a Buddha points out, the suffering that really weighs down on the mind is not the suffering that comes from other people. It's the suffering you cause yourself. So if you can win that battle, you've won an important one, the one that really matters. So look at the ways you're causing yourself to suffer. The Buddha starts out by saying you're not looking at the issue here. You're not giving it primary importance. When he defines ignorance, it's not so much ignorance of his teachings as a whole. It's more ignorance of the Four Noble Truths and the tasks appropriate to them. But just knowing those things doesn't end the problem. You have to actually undertake the tasks until you bring them to completion. That's when your ignorance is ended. And so how are you going to comprehend suffering? How are you going to let go of its cause so you can realize its cessation? Well, it's by developing the path. That's what we're working on right now. And what in the mind fights that? It says there are other things that are more important, other things you'd rather do right now. The part of the mind that tosses up all kinds of obstacles.
you could go along with the obstacles and just sort of block your path. Or you could learn how to take the Buddha's approach. Just look at how suffering feels from inside and all the processes that lead to suffering. How do they feel from inside? There's an issue that comes up often. People object to the idea of rebirth. They say, well, I can't get a clear ex explanation from the Buddha on the mechanics of rebirth. How could it work, especially given our modern scientific view of how things work? It doesn't make any sense. So we cling to our materialistic view, as if holding everything to the test of a materialistic view would be its proof or prove or disprove it. But has the materialistic view made us happy? It's provided us with some conveniences. It's solved any number of material problems. But it has never made people happy. It certainly hasn't made them better people than they were before. The human, human race is just as savage as it was. before the scientific revolution. So it should indicate that the, the materialistic view is not the final, doesn't have the final word on things. It's like the MBA approach to, to business, deciding that only one thing matters, and that's profit. Everything else has to be sacrificed for profit, and see what happens. Everything does get sacrificed. Societies break down. The social fabric gets torn apart. This sort of thing is what happens when one view becomes ascendant and demands all of its demands to be ascendant in every area. So when the Buddha was challenged, and it's not just nowadays that people are challenging the Buddha about the metaphysics of rebirth. Back in his time, it was a controversial issue. This is one of the major fallacies which you hear repeated over and over again, that the Buddha just picked up the idea of rebirth from his culture because that's what everybody believed and nobody thought to question it. People were questioning it. The question of, is the life force the same thing as a body or is it something else, separate from the body, something different from the body? That was directly related to the whole idea of rebirth. If the life force was something different from the body, then you had a metaphysical explanation for how rebirth could happen. If it was the same thing as the body, then rebirth would be impossible. But the Buddha refused to take a position on that. It's one of those ten questions he set aside. Because getting involved in the metaphysics gets you involved in one of those battles. It's not worth winning. You say, well, what is it that takes for breath? Well, where is it? Can you see it? And the Buddha entirely avoided the question of whether there was a what or no what behind the process, but he did explain this is how the process happens, and it's part of suffering. Birth, aging, illness, and death, these all come under the, the category of suffering. And you comprehend it not by comprehending it in terms of somebody's theory about how the world works, but in terms of how you experience the processes of the mind. This is where the battle is really important, because it's through craving that rebirth happens. Think of those four Dharma summaries. The world is insufficient, and there's no one in charge has nothing of its own. It's a slave to craving. So even though it's filled with aging, illness, and death, things that are in constant stressful in that self, it's that craving that keeps us coming back, coming back for all this unsatisfactory stuff. And if you can't win out over that, you haven't really won anything worthwhile. So it's something you can directly experience and something that lies under your control. You can put an end to it. It's something you're responsible for. You wouldn't be responsible for what takes birth, but you are responsible for the process. It's something you directly experience. 
This is why the Buddha's approach is what you would call phenomenology, how things are directly experienced without any reference to what there is behind your experience. Trying to impose your ideas of what's behind experience on somebody else, or letting them impose theirs on you. You're here meditating to look at exactly what your mind is doing right now to create suffering. It's through that craving and that ignorance. That's where the victory is. That's where the really worthwhile victory is. So this is what we're here for. The big issue in life is the fact that we don't want suffering, but we keep creating it. As a John Sawat would often say, it's through our own stupidity. That's how he translated ignorance often, stupidity. Because it's happening right before our very eyes, right here in the mind. It's not some mysterious process off someplace else. And it's causing suffering right before our eyes. The suffering is not off someplace else either. We're the ones who keep looking off someplace else, and we ignore what's right here, right now. So the meditation is what gives us tools to overcome that ignorance, to overcome that craving. That's what we're basically getting victory over. It's to see through these things, to understand why we're doing them. We think we can get some pleasure out of them, but we have to look very carefully at what is that pleasure. Again, it's not because we have some metaphysical belief about whether things have an essence or don't have an essence. That's pretty irrelevant. The reason we cling to things, and clinging here again, is not clinging to things, it's clinging to actions. We keep doing them over and over again, we're addicted to them, is because we believe that the pleasure they give outweighs the pain they cause. And the reason we see that that way is because we're not looking carefully. So this is one of the reasons why we try to develop a state of good, solid concentration in the mind where there is a sense of ease and well-being. That can come simply from being with the breath, being absorbed in the breath, filling the breath energy throughout the body with a sense of ease and well-being. Because then you have something to compare. You can look at the other pleasures you followed in life. Are they anything like this? Are they as steady, reliable, harmless as this kind of pleasure? So you're training the mind to be a connoisseur of pleasure so that you can really understand where the pleasure lies, where the pain lies and where things stack up, which pleasure is greater. Now about the pain of going back to your old ways of looking for pleasure. You see it a lot more easily when you're coming from this vantage point. So even though concentration isn't the ultimate, it does give you a higher standard for understanding what true, ple <coughs> what true pleasure can be. That doesn't automatically wean you off of your old ways of thinking, but it gives you a basis so that you can actually do it. Especially when you realize that following your, your daily pleasures is getting in the way of this, con this pleasure of concentration. You've got to make a choice. Once you admit the fact that you've got to make a choice. then it's easier to sort through your other pleasures and start, start seeing, okay, which ones am I willing to sacrifice? It's those old patterns of clinging based on craving and ignorance. Those are the things that you gain victory over. This is where the victory really matters. As for what people in the outside world might think, Why do you want to gain victory over their hearts? Why do you want to gain victory over their opinions? Well, 
what does it, what does it accomplish? Especially if they're resistant. You just develop bad habits, and you lose out to your own defilements. It's the defeat that really matters, that kind of defeat, to learn to turn it into a victory over your greed, aversion, and delusion, your craving, your ignorance, and your clinging. with this very personal suffering that you're causing yourself can finally stop. Nobody else needs to know, nobody else needs to praise you for this. Because when you reach this deathless element inside, it's its own reward. Worth much more than the opinion of other people. So give it a chance. See if what the Buddha said was really right, that this is where true happiness lies, and that there's no other happiness that can compare. As I said, the flavor of the Dharma beats all of our other flavors. So give his teachings a try and see if he's right.